You're listening to a message delivered at First Family Church in Bondurant, Iowa, from a sermon series, Son of God, Servant of Man, going through the Gospel of Mark. For more information and messages, please visit our website at www.ffcblife.com. So it kind of felt like this week that, you know, even though spring is here, it kind of feels like, you know, the little engine that could, that's trying to go up the, the steep grade, you know, I think I can, I think I can. And, you know, you think it's here and then it gets cold and anyway, it's a lot better. Hey, at least it's sunny and things are beginning to turn green. Well, we continue in our study of the gospel according to Mark. Son of God, servant of man. Uh, And as we begin this morning, I was thinking about a time that we went through as a family, meaning my family, about six years ago. Many of you know my wife, uh, Cheryl, at that time, it was around the time when we started the church, had some uh, health problems. And um, if you remember, if you were around, uh, she had extreme fatigue uh, to the point where she could be up and about for about an hour a day, Um, and we went to many doctors, and they didn't know why. They didn't know what to tell us. They didn't know what was going on. We went to great lengths. Uh, We spent uh, thousands of dollars to to talk to specialists and to ask them and to diagnose her, and and they came back and said, we don't know. We don't know what is going on. It was so bad that for about three months, uh, the church family brought us a meal three times a week. We were desperate having spent all that time, all that money, and yet with no answers. Well, as if you were around, you you know that at some point we did find out and discover that she had um, some problems with her her digestive health. And so we began to address that, and things got a little better, and she's now a lot better, and we're very grateful for that. She's not quite normal, but uh, we're very grateful that she is doing a lot better. Her health is not quite normal. (laughs) I'm like, what's the giggling for? And I had, to, I had to rewind that. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Okay, that's what I said. Well, you notice, like, I mean, if you or a loved one has a physical problem or a, a health condition, um, you, you would go to great lengths to have it addressed if it's possible, right? Just like we did. Um, in fact, if, if you ever ask, if you've been in that situation, you know what great lengths you would go to. I mean, you... Ask yourself, would would you travel hours away? Would you spend the money? Most of us would. Some of us do. If the condition is severe enough, and if we know there is some treatment that can be had. Um, You know, this morning, we're going to look at the Gospel of Mark chapter 2. There is a man with a severe physical condition At this point in his ministry, Jesus' fame is beginning to spread far and wide. He is known as a miracle worker. He's known as a healer. He is known for preaching that the kingdom of God had arrived because he was there. Not able to help himself, this man who has this severe physical condition is carried by four of his friends to see if Jesus could do anything or if he would do anything. They go to great lengths to address the issue. However, as we will see, before Jesus addresses his physical condition, Jesus addresses his greatest need, which is spiritual healing. And as we will also see, his greatest need is our greatest need. So if you're not already there, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2, where we look at the historical account of when Jesus met this man's greatest need and learned that Jesus is the only one who could meet that need, not only for him, but for us as well. So Mark chapter 2, we'll be going through verses 1 through 12 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, please turn it on or turn there to Mark chapter 2 as I begin reading As per usual, I will address any questions you may have 
at the end of the message. You can text that in. The number is at the bottom of your notes. So, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went into the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Amazing story, isn't it? Now, in order to understand what's going on here, we're going to look at this account uh, from the perspective of the characters in the account. We're going to consider the characters, and there's four of them. There's four characters in this story of Jesus healing the paralytic. And they are, first, the curious spectators, and then we'll look at, secondly, the crippled sinner, and the compassionate Savior, and then lastly, the callous scribes. Now, to be fair, I did not come up with this list on my own, right? I'm not that clever to alliterate that way. I actually took that from one of my commentaries on the Gospel of Mark. But I do believe it's an excellent way to view this passage and to look at it as we look at each character or groups of characters and see what was going on, why they did what they did, why they said what they said, so that we can understand what our greatest need is and that only Jesus can meet our greatest need. So, let's start with the first group. The curious spectators. These are the crowds or the crowd that gathered around when Jesus returns to Capernaum. Mark records that after having healed the leper at the end of chapter 1, which we looked at last week, after healing the leper, Jesus can't even go into the cities anymore because they just flock to Him. Right? So he's teaching them out in the countryside and they're all coming to him as he's preaching to them the kingdom of God. However, several days, perhaps maybe several weeks later, Jesus manages to sneak back into Capernaum unnoticed, at least for a time. He gets back into Capernaum and Mark says that he goes home or it says that it, he was heard that he was at home, literally in the house, it says. Now, presumably, we think it's Peter and Andrew's house because the only house in the context that he's been to is their house. And we also know from the book of Luke, Jesus said that the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So it's not his home, but it's their home. Word spreads fast. They hear Jesus is back in town. And the people flock to the house. It was so crowded that the, the, the door was blocked. You couldn't get in there. Hundreds, maybe even thousands again, like we saw before, flocked to Peter and Andrew's house. Now, I say these people are curious spectators because I believe the majority of them have gathered, not to necessarily hear Jesus preach, but to see what he's going to do. They want to see more miracles. These are merely curious spectators, right? I think they're not true believers who want to repent of their sin. They just want to see hey, what's going to happen next? We've seen this before. Maybe we can see it again. And the text tells us that Jesus, knowing what they needed, is speaking the Word to them. And here's one of those reasons why I, I think they're only curious spectators. He's speaking the Word to them. Now, the Word, or we can say even the message that He's speaking to them, is 
repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Look at chapter 1, verse 14. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the Gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled. The Kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the Gospel. That's the message. That's the Word. That's what He's teaching these people. And yet there's no record that these masses or these crowds that gather around Him, there's no record in the Gospels that these people responded in repentance, which is what Jesus is calling for. In other words, they're just gathering to Him because He's known as a healer. We see that in chapter 1, verse 32. They came after sunset and they brought to Him all those who were ill and demon-possessed and He began to heal them. They want to see that again. These people don't get it. They think Jesus is just a miracle worker. Perhaps, maybe they think He's a prophet from God, but there's no indication that they were willing to or even think they needed to respond to His call to repentance by repenting. There's no proof at least at this point that they believe his claim his claim to be messiah the one who was to come and bring the kingdom of god that's what he said there's no record of that in fact what we see when when jesus heals this crippled man in fact when he forgives his sins before he does that it doesn't seem like they submit to that claim doesn't seem that they follow suit they think Jesus is just a man. They're not getting the point here. They don't understand that it is God in the flesh who is standing before them and that He is making that claim. In fact, the account in Matthew says this. This is why I say they think He's only a man. It says, but when the crowd saw this after He heals His man, they were awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to men. They think He's just a man. They don't get it. They think he's probably sent from God, but they don't realize that he's claiming to be God. They're just there for the show. They're there to see what Jesus could do. They're there to see another miracle. They're not willing or ready to repent of their sins, which is exactly what Jesus is calling for. In fact, I'll even say that another reason why I think they're just curious spectators. Jesus pronounces a curse on this city of Capernaum, along with two other cities. Listen to this. This comes from Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 20. Then he, that's Jesus, began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracle, miracles were done. One of them was Capernaum. Listen. Because they did not repent. Woe to you, he says, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sidon and Tyre in the day of judgment than for you. Listen to this, verse 23. And you, Capernaum, in other words, likewise, just like Capernaum, will not be exalted in heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades, for if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, he goes on to say, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. In other words, these people are there to see the show. They're not there to respond to the message. They're not ready to address their sin. They were not ready to trust in the Son of God who was right there in their presence. By the way, just because a crowd gathers doesn't mean they're gathering for the right reason. So those are the curious spectators. Then there's the the crippled sinner. This is the paralytic man. Now, the term paralytic is simply a person who is paralyzed. And we know what that term means. They can't physically move their bodies. Maybe sometimes their upper body, but they can't walk. They can't move by themselves they're dependent on others to care for them and that's what we see here in this passage this man has to be carried by four other men he's completely incapacitated now in the first century homes had a flat roof right either you had an external stairway that got you onto the roof or sometimes they would have a ladder and these flat roofs in the first century were used to either uh, you know, dry their fruit or perhaps even sleep out there on the roof on hot summer nights or even to find peace when there's a contentious woman in the home. 
If you don't get that reference, look at Proverbs chapter 21, verse 9, and you understand what I'm talking about. Anyway, these people were unable to get around the crowds, so they climbed the roof, they got on, they removed one of the tiles, and they lowered this man so he could gain access to Jesus. Now, we don't know how long this man had been in this condition. The text doesn't tell us. We don't know if this man was perhaps born this way. We don't know if this man had an accident. Nor do we know if this man's condition was due to some of his own sin. Yes, it is possible to endure a physical affliction or a disease because of our own sin. I'll show you a couple examples. Look at, this comes from the book of Psalms. Psalm 107, 17 says, Fools, because of their rebellious way and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. In other words, because of their sin, they were afflicted. In the church in Corinth, chapter 11, Paul is talking about how there's division in the church and how they're not getting along and how they're not treating each other equally. And Paul says, For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you sleep. In other words, a number of them were taken in judgment, in death, because of their own sin. Jesus Himself, in the book of John, said this to the man He healed at the pool of Bethsaida. He comes to Him in John chapter 5, verse 14. He says, Behold, you have become well. Listen to this. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. So yes, some sicknesses, some physical conditions are due to personal sin. Not all of them are, but some of them are. Now we don't know if this crippled man became crippled because he sinned. However, this is what we do know. We know that this man is a sinner. How do we know that? It's because Jesus identifies him as a sinner. Jesus understands this man's condition. He understands this man, like every other human being other than himself, is a sinner. And we also know that this man was ready to address his sin. I say this because when you can, when you think about what is Jesus saying, every, almost every other few verses it talks about he is preaching the word to them, he's preaching repentance to them. I came for this reason to preach. This is what Jesus is doing. So in response to the message, his friends bring this man to Jesus. And it says, Jesus, seeing their faith, says to the man, son or or child, your sins are forgiven. The only way Jesus is going to utter that, the only way He's going to be pleased by their actions is because He perceives that this man is responding to the message or the call to repent. This man is ready to repent. This guy is eager. Jesus wasn't there to impress them with his ability. Jesus was there to command and demand repentance from them. This was his message. That's why he was there. That's what he was doing. Right? He's not impressed by people who are just there to see his miracles. I just read you an example in Matthew chapter 11. He's not impressed by that. He is impressed and pleased by those who are ready to repent. He perceived their faith, and the only way Jesus would grant forgiveness to this man is if this man understood he needed it. Hebrews 11.6 says this. We're familiar with this verse. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. That's the only way Jesus would have granted this man forgiveness is if this man admitted to his need for forgiveness and was willing to repent of his sin. This was his greatest need. It wasn't his physical healing, but spiritual forgiveness. And Jesus, seeing his faith, grants it. and says, child, your sins are forgiven. There's more proof, I think, that, that, that he believed Jesus. Right? We read that after... After he heals this man, he tells him, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And what does the man do? He does exactly that. 
He believes Jesus. He doesn't question. He obeys. Now, this man may have never walked in his life. At the very least, he hadn't walked in a long time. He was a paralytic. And yet, when Jesus of Nazareth commands this man to get up, the man believed him. He got up and walked. Put simply, the crippled sinner responded to the Gospel in faith. The next character we see is the compassionate Savior. This is Jesus. Now, we've already witnessed what Jesus' ministry is all about. right? He's preaching the gospel of repentance. That's His primary goal. That's why He came. Verse 38, He says, Let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. Before going to the cross, That's Jesus' mission. That's His goal. He just returns to Capernaum after having gone on a multi-day, if not a multi-week, preaching circuit through the region of Galilee. Preaching this message. He was performing miracles, but that wasn't His primary purpose. The miracles were to testify that He had the authority to say what He was saying to the people. He had the right to demand repentance, for he was the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. So again, we see the crowd gathers. They want to see miracles. So large and dense, they couldn't even carry the man through. They had to go through the roof of the house. And once again, we see Jesus, knowing what the crowd needs, begins to teach on repentance. In the middle of what he is saying, you can kind of see it. The dirt begins to fall from the ceiling. And the reason I say that is because that's what their ceilings were made of. Mud, dirt, straw, some twigs, compacted really hard. But there's nothing in the text where it says Jesus is annoyed. In fact, there's every indication that Jesus was pleased by their actions. We know He was pleased because of what He said. Your sins are forgiven. Everyone is expecting Jesus to heal this man. Everyone's like, ooh, what's what's going to happen now? But before he even heals the man, he does exactly what they did not expect. In fact, he stuns the crowd by what he does, or more specifically, by what he says. He says, child, your sons are, or your sins are forgiven. Why would he say that? Why would he go there? It's because that's what he's talking about. That's what his whole ministry is about. That's been his whole focus. That is his entire message. He's speaking to the people for their need to repent for their own sins. That's what he's speaking about. That's what he's teaching about. That's what he's preaching about. He is saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Matthew calls it the gospel of the kingdom. His entire ministry is about commanding people to repent. I find it fascinating that Jesus' singular focus in His ministry is this message. In fact, by the way, you can't talk about Jesus accurately and faithfully if you don't talk about repentance. To fail to talk about repentance is to misrepresent Christ and what He said and what He did and what He's all about. So if you, if you ever want to know, is, is that, that teacher, is that ministry, is it faithful to the biblical Christ? Ask yourself that question. Are they speaking about Him according to His Word? And are they speaking the whole counsel of God, which includes repentance? That's who Jesus is. You can't talk about Him without talking about Repentance. This is the reason why he says to the crippled sinner, your sins are forgiven. It was his greatest need. This man, more than anything, needed forgiveness from God. And Jesus compassionately knows that. And he gives it to him. Because this man was willing to repent. Willing to address what he needed most. Of course he wanted to be healed. Who wouldn't? But more than that, I believe he wanted to be forgiven. 
Again, Jesus saw his faith. Jesus perceived. I mean, look at the verse that follow. What does it say? The scribes began to say in what? Look at this. Reasoning in their hearts. What does that mean? On the inside. They're reasoning. How can this man do this? And what does the text tell us? That Jesus, what? Immediately, Jesus aware, at verse 8, in His Spirit, that they were reasoning that way within themselves. Jesus can see into the human heart and He knows what's there. And He knows what the need is. Listen to this. This is, comes from the book of John chapter 2. Indication that Jesus knows what's going on on the inside. Now when He was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in His name, observing His signs which He was doing. You're thinking, great, that's awesome. But look what it says. But Jesus, on His part, was not entrusting Himself to them, for He knew all men, and because He did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for He Himself knew what was in man. In other words, they, Jesus knows they're only here for the miracles. Jesus knows what's on the inside. And He knew what was on the inside of this man. He knows the hearts and minds of this of these people. He knew the mind and the heart of the crippled man and he knew that he had the faith that he required to repent, turn from his sin, and believe in Jesus as the only way to have his sins forgiven. Now think about this. Right? We're looking post-cross, after the cross. We say, we celebrate, we glory in the fact that Jesus what went to the cross that He died in our place, and that when He paid the penalty for our sin, He exclaimed what? It is finished, right? We, we're, we're post-cross after that event. Consider when He is saying this. He is saying to this man, your sins are forgiven before He even goes to the cross. How could He say that? How could He say He's already forgiven? Jesus, you haven't gone to the cross yet. You haven't made payment yet. And it's simply this. Jesus knew that no one and nothing would stop Him from fulfilling the Father's will and dying on our behalf. No one and nothing would stop Him from raising from the dead and proclaiming victory over death and saying, it is finished. Jesus knew that. Don't you love that? So confident in what He was about to do some years later that Jesus can say, I got, I got it covered. I'll take care of it. You will be forgiven because I am going to die for your sins. However, not everybody's impressed with Jesus, are they? Not everybody is repress, impressed by Jesus. Not everyone's willing to trust in Him. Not everyone's willing to repent. And now we come to the fourth character or group of characters in this account, the calloused scribes. Scribes. Sometimes in our, in our Bibles, they are listed as the lawyers. And these were men who would copy, study, and interpret the law of God or what we usually call the Old Testament. Now, the scribes were usually from the group, religious group of the Pharisees. Sometimes they weren't, but Almost always they were Pharisees. If you know anything about Pharisees, we read about them a lot in the Scriptures. The Pharisees find their origin all the way from the time of Ezra. And they actually started out good. We're going to get into a little bit of their background in the weeks to come. But the Pharisees simply means they were the separated ones. They were the ones who went out of their way to be holy as God commanded His people to be holy. In the first century, they were considered the religious elite. They were highly respected by the people. In fact, you get an indication of it. Look what it says. But it says, verse 6, but some of the scribes were sitting there. Now, picture this scene. There are hundreds, if not thousands of people gathered around Peter's house. And they're trying to get in to see Jesus. What's he going to do? Don't you think it would have been pretty difficult to find a place to sit down? These men are sitting. You know what that means? They had the place of honor. The people respected them. These were the 
religious superstars. Yet, even though they were viewed that way, they looked with contempt upon the people. They thought they were better than the people. They thought they were more righteous than them. They were very zealous. They were very religious. They had many standards and many rules. But they were calloused on the inside. Apparently, these scribes, along with the Pharisees, had come from the the region of Galilee, all over Galilee and Judea, and even Jerusalem. Now, the reason we know that is if you look at Luke chapter 5, verse 17, he adds that little fact. In other words, they came from far and wide to see Jesus. They want to know, hey, we've heard about this guy. We heard about what he's doing. We heard about what he's saying. Let's go, let's go check it out. He's preaching repentance. Why? Now, I am convinced that they were convinced that they didn't think they needed to repent. They didn't think that they were unrighteous. They didn't think that they were sinners. For they believed they were righteous, even though they were only self-righteous. They, of all the people in that room, were most shocked to hear Jesus say what he said. Forgive sins? Who does this man think he is? By the way, they're right. Only God can forgive sins. That's right. That's correct. They're right in that assessment. They're right also into thinking that Jesus is claiming to be God by making that statement. For them, this is blasphemy. A serious offense against God. Blasphemy is simply the act of insulting or showing contempt toward God. Now, the blasphemy that they think Jesus is committing, in their eyes, is the worst kind. First century Jews thought there was three levels of blasphemy. First level is if you speak evil against the law or word of God. Remember, they accused Paul of that in the book of Acts. That's the first level of blasphemy. You want to get into deeper trouble, you go to the second level of blasphemy, and you speak evil against the person of God. That's like second degree blasphemy to the first century Jews. But Jesus goes to step three, which was to make yourself equal to God. That's like the worst kind of blasphemy in their eyes. In their minds, Jesus could have done nothing worse than what He just did by claiming to be equal with God. But Jesus, and not for the first time by the way, confronts them. He first asks them, why do you think I'm committing blasphemy? Why are you, why are you reasoning about these things within your hearts. And then he goes on and he asks them this rhetorical question. We read it. He goes and he says, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? In other words, he asks them a rhetorical question which is simply a question that has an obvious answer. And the, uh, the answer is obvious. What's easier? To say something or to do something? The answer is, well, just say it. It's probably easier. Even though to forgive sins is no small thing. And then he gives them the opportunity to repent. He says this. Verse 10, but so that you may know. I love that. Jesus wants them to, Jesus' heart is for them to know. He wants them, he gives them an opportunity. Listen, You've gotten it wrong so far. You're not, it's not getting through. But I'm going to do something for you so that it can get through. To penetrate the mind and then the heart so that you will submit to me like this crippled sinner has. What does he do? He does what he usually does. He performs a miracle to testify to the fact that he has the authority to do and say what he does. To prove that he really is who he says he is. And he commands the crippled sinner, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk out. 
And the man does it. I mean, can you imagine what this would have looked like? A man who was clearly physically incapacitated, a paralyzed man, proven by the fact that he can't even make his way to Jesus. He needs four men to carry him. What does that mean? He didn't need just someone to you know, carry him on their shoulders. He couldn't do anything. Brought in before Jesus, physically weak man, particularly his legs. Might have never used them. At the very least, he hadn't used them for a long time, possibly decades. Now, if you've ever had a physical injury, broken limb or you know, broken bone, become immobilized in some way, you know what muscle atrophy is, don't you? You know what happens when we don't move around. Muscle atrophy is when our muscles be shrink and they become weak because of lack of use. When I was in ninth grade, I was in a soccer game and I'm charging towards the goalie. I made a run and it was just me and the goalie and he took me out. He shoved his knee into my, my right thigh and fractured my femur. Now, I did get him back. I scored on him, and I shouldn't have gone back in the game. But anyway, that's another story. I was in crutches, and I had a leg brace for like three months. And then when it, the doctor could see that it healed after taking x-rays, he then ordered physical therapy for me. I remember when I took that brace off and I go to physical therapy, uh, my leg had shrunk. Now, I wasn't the most muscular guy on the field, but, I, you know, having played soccer for 10 years, I had pretty strong legs. My calf muscle was no bigger than my forearm. It had atrophy, right? Pitifully weak. This man would have had atrophied muscles. No physical capability to get up, pick up his pallet, and walk away. He was paralyzed. Possibly had never walked in his life, yet it says what? He believes in Jesus, he gets up, and he walks out. And everyone, what does the text say? They were all amazed and glorified God. We have never seen anything like this. They're stunned. What's going on there? Why did Jesus do that? Indeed, it's a mercy to the crippled sinner, right? That's a mercy. But why does he do it right in front of everybody? Particularly right in front of the callous scribes. What's he doing? He's saying, listen, you need to get something straight here. I am the only one who can forgive sins, and I have the authority to forgive sins, and here is the proof. Undeniable miracle right before their eyes. Unfortunately, they were hard-hearted. They were callous. They remain not only skeptical of Jesus, but we will soon see they become his enemies. Very sad. Rather than admit to their own sin, rather than agree with Jesus that they are sinners before a God who is holy, perfect, and righteous, they remain obstinate in their hard-heartedness and say, no, we don't need to repent, and they reject him. The Scriptures only record a few of these people coming to faith. Indeed, Paul's one of them, and there are a few others, but not many. As a group, they reject him. It's very sad. Very sad. Now, in the time remaining, I want to ask you a few questions. As we look at this account of Jesus once again preaching repentance, proving that he has the authority to do that, and being merciful even to those who at the present time were rejecting him, where do you think you, if you were one of these characters, who do you think you're like? Ask yourself. Are you a curious spectator? 
Are you most interested in what Jesus can do for you without a willingness to repent? Do you want Jesus to do what you want rather than what you need? Listen to this. And I say this, I don't say this lightly, but I say this because I am concerned and I care. Hell will be filled with many people who are in this category. And guess what? They are people who go to church and have some connection with Jesus. Matthew chapter 7. We know it. The end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus Himself said, many, I shudder when I read that word, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, look at all the stuff we did. And Jesus goes, depart from me. You workers of iniquity. I don't know you. I don't have a relationship with you. You never came to me with the willingness to repent of your sin and trust in me for forgiveness. Perhaps some of us are like the scribes. Thinking that sure, I might not be perfect, but I'm not that bad. I mean... I'm not a habitual liar. I'm not a thief. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a terrorist. And when confronted with your own sin, like the scribes, you might think that you can do a bunch of things to make up for some of the bad things that you did and make it right. Yeah, I, 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 sometimes I do some bad things. I, I admit, I'm not perfect, but I do far more good things. I mean, I go to church, I read my Bible, I pray, I work hard, I pay my taxes. I'm not that bad. And God's going to look at that and He's going to go, you know what? I think you got more good things than bad things. Let me tell you something. That makes zero difference to Jesus. Jesus is not impressed by what we can do for Him. He's not going to look at this scale and say, well, let's see how good you are. Not going to happen. The idea that you can do enough good things to earn forgiveness from God is straight out demonic and satanic. That is from the very pit of hell. No one can earn forgiveness. It has to be granted. And the first thing we need to do is to admit that and cry out to God for mercy. Or maybe, and this is my prayer, this is my hope, most of us are like the crippled sinner. Most of us believe that our greatest need is forgiveness from God whom we have sinned against with our thoughts, with our actions, and with our lips. We understand that there is no possible way under heaven that we could ever earn His forgiveness. We understand that it can only be given. And we understand that the only way to attain forgiveness is to believe what Jesus said. That our sin is as bad as He says it is. And that our sin deserves the righteous, the holy, the all-powerful wrath of God. But that it can be forgiven if we believe in the One whom He sent. That is Jesus, the Son of God the servant of man, our Savior. Are we those people? Do we believe that Jesus is the King? This is the Gospel of the Kingdom. My question is, are you in the Kingdom? And if you are, you know how sweet it is and you know you don't deserve to be there. Who are you? If you've repented, you know who you are. If you haven't, if you're still alive, meaning you're right here sucking wind, right? There's still time. There is still the opportunity. Everyone sins. But not everyone is forgiven. Only those who repent of their sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the One whom God sent as Savior and Lord. Is He your Savior? I hope He is. If He's not, 
I'd love to introduce them to you. So, simply in this, these few 12 verses, is simply, this is what we learn. Forgiveness is our greatest need, and Jesus is the only one who can grant it. There is salvation in no other name under heaven but the name of Jesus. Everyone sins, but not everyone is forgiven. Only those who cry out to Christ for it. We've got two questions. If some suffering can be but, not, but is not always punishment from God for specific disobedience, and we are all sinners, how much does it matter that we figure out why we are suffering? Does our response to suffering differ based on the cause of the suffering? Or is our response basically the same regardless of the cause? That's a very good question. So, um, if you have prolonged sickness or a disease, I would, this is how I do it, I would ask, ask yourself, and ask the Lord, Lord, are you, are you doing something in this to teach me something? Are you humbling me for a very specific purpose? I believe God will tell you, and I believe you will know. Now, how should our response be to it? Or what should our response be to it? Well, let's talk about what it usually is. We ask for God to either heal us or uh, you know, get, do away with what we're going through. And then we find ourselves, sometimes He does do that. And then there are times when He doesn't. And it's in those times when we think to ourselves, He doesn't even answer. Prayer doesn't work. It's like, no, He has answered. He just said no. Then we need to ask ourselves, okay, why? Why did he say no? We have an example of the Apostle Paul who had a thorn in the flesh, which I believe was an opposing false teacher, but it could have been something physical. It says he asked him three times, Lord, remove it. And the Lord says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, it's good that it remains. And I tend to think when you look at the context of 2 Corinthians it was to keep Paul humble. So, that's how I would respond to it. And also, this isn't the only reason why we suffer. There are several reasons. This is just one of them, possibly. Sometimes we suffer to purify our faith. Sometimes we suffer so that we would depend upon God and only Him for everything and anything. All right? so there are several reasons, but when it could be that, I'd always ask, Lord, is this connected to, I believe He'll tell you, Verse 12 says that they were all amazed and glorified God. Does this mean the scribes had a change of heart? Yeah, I do. I, I mean, I, could, I believe they couldn't deny the fact that this was miraculous. I believe they were stunned and amazed, like, wow. But here's why I think they didn't have a change of heart. At least not the most of them did not as a group. Because in the next few weeks, we're going to see where Jesus confronts these self-righteous people. We're going to see in the next three messages. And he unravels their self-righteousness. And we're going to see, when he begins to go after them like that, at some point they decide this guy's got to go. And they decide to kill him. So, that's why I think most of them, if maybe not any of them, at least in this group, didn't have a change of heart. As the band comes forward, here's, here's what I want you to think about is we get ready to enjoy communion together. Before we even knew what we needed, Jesus had decided to go to the cross. That verse we read in Ephesians chapter 1 at the beginning of the service, in love, it says, He predestined us to the adoption as sons. In other words, before we even ever took a breath, Jesus already knew what we would need. Jesus already knew that we would sin. Jesus already knew that we would be rebels, and yet Jesus went to the cross anyway so that we might be forgiven, so that we might be renewed in our relationship to God. That's what the cross is all about. Father, thank you for your son. 
He is our greatest hope and our greatest joy. He did what we could not do. Lord, I pray if there's anybody in this room who has not submitted to His command to repent, I pray that You would bring about new life. Only You can. For those of us who have been granted repentance, may we glory and be thankful that Jesus saved us. Unworthy sinners, but now children of the Most High God. Amen.